Welcome everybody to another episode of Courage Over Comfort. My next guest is a remarkable guy. I actually, I believe the first conversation I had with him was on a football field. And I'm not a football fan, but he's a former NFL uh, player and played with some greats. And I hope that he'll talk about that a little bit too. But he just, I found, um, I remember a conversation, the, the probably the most in-depth one that we had had on a football field in La Crescent, Minnesota. And I'm not sure if you remember that conversation at all, but please help me. Well, you, you know what? Introduce yourself. I'm going to get your last name wrong if I try it. <laughs> okay. That happens a lot, so don't I worry bet. about it. <laughs> um, my name is Kurt Pluger. I am a church planting pastor in Byron, Minnesota, and that's how Matt and I met. His son, Javen, was a senior, uh, and I coach football at Byron High School, and I think probably a lot of our interactions were in the press box when yes. you were yes. filming, um, and so we'll forget any comments I might have made in the press box that, <laughs> that weren't appropriate, but I, I think we're okay. <laughs> you know, I just did my thing, right? I didn't really, it didn't really bother me anything else around, so yeah, that's good. Hey, thanks a lot for being here. Church yeah. planter from NFL to a church planter. Um, when did you play, though? You played uh, a while ago. It's been a while, yeah. yeah. Um, back in 1985 through 1987. Sure. Played for four different teams. I was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys, so I played for Tom Landry, which was really a, a great experience. Um, met a lot of solid men of faith like Tom Landry when I played. I also played uh, the Green Bay Packers, the Buffalo Bills, the Minnesota Vikings. So there, Packer and Vikings fans, wow. I can offend both of you. But, <laughs> um, but as I told my son one time, I'm like, well, if they, they call your name and you're going to, because he's like, how could you, he's a huge Vikings fan. He's how, okay, how could you go okay. and play for the Packers? Like when someone offers you money <laughs> to play football, you say, yeah, when do you want me there? Yeah. And, uh, and actually, you know, enjoyed our time in Green Bay. It's an interesting place, very different than some of the other places in terms of it's a smaller town. It's a different, really a different atmosphere there versus the glamour of Dallas. So sure. my wife even appreciated that. But some of those were short stints, some of them were longer, but basically three years, and it was an injury that ended my career, as it does for, for a number of guys, since the average career yeah. is about three years. What position did you play? I was a defensive end, Okay. and so uh, a lot of people look at me and they say, how is that possible? And I just yeah, tell them- Yeah, because you're small. <laughs> I'm a shell of my former self. Yeah. So a guy asked me what I played. He thought I was a wide receiver, which sure. is interesting. And in, in, in the era of huge wide receivers yes, now, yes. it wasn't that way when I played. But um, yeah, so I'm about, it might even be close to 50 pounds lighter wow. than I was when I okay. played. So yeah. it's, it's, a different, it's a different world now for me. I, well, before we started rolling with the, the cameras and the audio here, I learned something that I was really shocked by, honestly, and you talked about uh, your school time, right? Mm -hmm. in, in, I believe it started in middle school, you said. Is yeah. that correct? And, and maybe, Share that story a, yeah. a little bit. Yeah, and maybe even at a, at a younger age. So what probably the rest of the story, like Paul yeah. Harvey used to do, <laughs> For me was that I was kind of a skinny, awkward kid with, with big ears. I actually was so interesting going way back to the beginning. Um, I was born with a crossed eye. So it was okay. an interesting process when I was young because I had an extra muscle in my right eye. I still don't have very good vision out of my right eye. Hmm. Um, and so I remember, even as a toddler now, seeing everything in double. But at the time, maybe not knowing the difference that, yeah. so, so somehow when i'd see two plates on the on the table i could decipher which one was the real food <laughs> and which was the air food like peter pan like yeah i, I, right? I, could, the... I could tell the difference um so that went on until just before my third birthday and they had to do a surgery where they removed my right eye and removed this extra muscle put sure. it back in the result of that is they put a patch on my eye when i was maybe kindergarten first grade I was not a great baseball player. That was not one of my sports, but that year was horrible because you could imagine yeah. they wanted to strengthen my right eye, yeah. put a patch over my left eye, and the eye I couldn't see very well was the only eye I had, so probably had a record number of errors that year <laughs> playing baseball as a little kid. But later, a friend of mine who's an optometrist... But those those errors, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't mean to pause you, but yeah. those errors are so important, aren't they? they? They actually build resilience in our life. They build a muscle. 
Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway, but continue the story. Yeah, Sorry. well, you're, you're right. You're right about that. And it probably is what made me driven in athletics yeah. is the mistakes or struggling through the awkward years. Um, one sport I, I never struggled a lot to play was football. That was more of a natural even back in the, the flag football days. <laughs> but still, kind of kind of an awkward kid. Yeah. Um, you know, I even remember a conversation that my brother, who was a four-sport athlete, you can do that wow. in Iowa, yeah. and my dad, and my dad saying, well, you know, he's into motorcycles and horses, but I don't know how good an athlete he's going to be. And this is a conversation they had when I was probably in those middle middle school years. But Going back to our story, so that was one issue I dealt with as as a young child trying to adapt um, when I couldn't see very well and spending a summer. And then it went right back to poor vision again because, as an optometrist friend told me, he said, you needed to be younger when they did that. So, Oh, even yeah, younger. Even oh, younger wow. than I was at the time. I think I was more like third grade. He said they should have done it when you were okay, sure. five, six years old, and then maybe the change would have taken place because my right eye eventually did get stronger. But when they took the patch off, um, your body is an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, what happened is your optic nerve is smart enough that if that if you've got issues with one of your eye, your your brain will naturally default to the good one if the right one is not working correctly. So what happened is is that that optic nerve damage or whatever happened just so it just didn't recover, and so I I spent you know all of the rest I've spent the rest of my life um, from the age three I've wore glasses or contacts thankfully I transitioned to contacts in high school that made sports <laughs> a, a lot, lot e easier a lot easier but um so does that mess with your depth perception quite a bit it does still today or do you, it, did you kind of get accustomed to it well I could I could get accustomed to it in football and basketball and I ran track obviously depth perception not as big a deal in yeah. track although I was a hurdler so you, you better know <laughs> that's where that hurdle yeah. is um speaking of obstacles in life um but I think it did affect me in depth perception in baseball I was never I played softball as I got older but it was always hard for me because depth perception is huge in baseball. For sure. And basketball, and, too. And, and basketball. But being that I was a post player, yeah. oh, and sure. my coach didn't want me to shoot for more than about <laughs> you know, 8 to 10 feet away because I, I, I took out the garbage, we used to always say. Rebounds, <laughs> right. block shots, and, and score points underneath. That was, that was my position yeah. because you know, I was the tallest guy on the team and sure. played underneath. So I could adjust in basketball. Um, but yeah, it does affect you in, in certainly in certain elements. For example, I had to learn how to shoot a rifle with mm. left-handed because okay. my right eye, I can't sight in very well. So I had to learn to shoot left-handed. That's interesting. That. So there, I learned something a long time ago now, but that we, even when both of our eyes work right, we have a dominant eye, mm -hmm. right? I'm very right-handed. I mean, extremely yep. right-handed. The only thing that I could do with my left hand was basketball. I, I could dribble about mm -hmm. as good with my left hand as my right. But I have to shoot left, left-eyed, mm. because my left eye is extremely more dominant than my right eye. Yeah. And that's really interesting. So I had to do the opposite of what you had to do. Mm -hmm. I'm right-handed, but left-eye dominant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, had to sh I have to shoot left-handed. Yeah, because my left eye is dominant. Yeah, and but yet I'm right dominant, so I get it. Right, right where you're at. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, uh, are you a pretty good shot? I'm not bad. You yeah. know, I uh, got like free throw shooting. I got better as I got older. <laughs> my junior year it was embarrassing because my field goal percentage was 58 percent, but my free throw was like 37 percent. Sure, and I I upped that to 60 some percent free throw by the time I was a senior, but. It, it affected that, but but you adjust. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that I've ever been a, a great shooter from the outside. Yeah. Never never played outside, but you know did pretty well underneath and learned how to adjust and shoot free throws pretty well. But um, yeah, it, they needed me to do other things. You know, <laughs> like I said, they needed it's, me to to rebound and to play defense, set picks, and it's good to know. focus on yeah. one job though, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and and I probably still scored maybe 10 points a game, but we had good shooters. And the interesting thing is I'm old enough that there was no three point shot. Yeah. So I'm old enough to remember when they brought it in. Yeah. <laughs> so we had on my high school basketball team, 
we were shooting 20 footers before they were even worth three points because we had good outside shooters. So sure. that was how we'd work it inside, outside. I'd kick it back out yeah. uh, in our offense. We had really good shooters. So I often reflect, I wonder, we had a pretty good team, and I wonder how good we would have been if they would have had the three point shot because right. we had some good outside shooters. And I was just underneath to, to take care of the, the stuff inside yeah. while, while our shooters did it. So I never really became a great outside shooter and didn't really need to be. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yep. Go, go ahead, continue. Yep. Like, uh, So one of the things that was interesting, one of the most traumatic experiences in my life was moving from Iowa to Minnesota, which seems hard to believe, but <laughs> those of us who lived in Iowa for- What part of Iowa then? Um, I was born in Iowa Falls, Iowa. Um, okay. Grew up most of my years in, in Webster City, sure. Iowa, North Central, near 35W. Um, and so my dad transferred jobs, and I was actually excited to move. So the interesting part is we moved to Lesueur, Minnesota, and some mm-hmm. most of you might know where Lesueur is, home of the Green Giant. Yep. Uh, the big sign is there when you come into town. So I moved there when I was in seventh grade. I completed seventh grade, um, actually spent a couple of days at school because we had finished up earlier in Iowa than what Lesueur did. Mm. Um, so a couple of days of school. Well, when I left Iowa, uh, the response was, you're moving to to Le Sewer, uh, the sewer. I mean, that was that was the comments I'd get. And then, of course, when I moved to Minnesota, it was like, you're from Iowa? And then, you know. Yeah. So that was when it became difficult because, you know, of course, back then it was junior high, senior high for us, not middle school. And, and typically in a lot of smaller communities like Le Sewer, uh, at the time was maybe 4,000 people, mm-hmm. seven through 12 were in the same building. Yeah. And I've been in that building. Oh, have you? On your stage. Oh, have you? Yeah, okay. So yeah. you spoke, did, did, yeah, did your deal yeah, there? Okay. Yeah, I yeah. might still have a track record on the wall. Is there? I'm not sure. For the high hurdles. So yeah. I think my intermediate hurdle one got broke, but for okay. the high hurdles, it might still be there. I'm not sure. I'll have to look. I, I, <laughs> I should uh, reach out to them again. I haven't been there in, in a while. Yeah. Um, but those were some, some tough years because yeah. being an awkward kid, um, and I got picked on in junior high, kind of, you know, people talk about bullying now. It was sort of open season. When I when I grew up in Iowa, if you were a seventh grader, it was kind of open season for eighth and ninth graders to pick on you. Sure. Um, I remember being pushed from behind. I remember being tripped on my way to industrial shop. Um, I remember one kid back when instead of a, a, we didn't have combination locks. We had actual keys to our lockers. And, and one kid who was older stole my key, and then, he, and then in the venting part of the lock, he shoved it in there, and so I couldn't get into my locker, had to get a custodian to open it up. And my brother would have the same thing. He used to come home from school with bruises. So, I mean, mm. th- this whole idea of, of bullying and stuff, it's, it's, what makes it harder now is it's nonstop on social media. Yeah. But I even remember that as a kid, and particularly if you're an awkward kid with glasses, I, I just remember kids sitting down at the lunch table across from me, older kids, and they just started making fun of me. Um, and, you know, just, just like open season, you know, that's how, yeah. that's how it was. And so it took courage to go to school. So you talk about courage over comfort. Um, it took courage just to go to school and, and deal with some of that and, and know who to avoid. Um, I had an older brother, but at that time, see, in Iowa, the junior high and high school were separate. So I had an older brother that could have protected me, but he was at the high school. So, so that was kind of the beginning of that experience of what it's like to be bullied and, and made fun of. Can I ask you a question? And you can brush off and go on with the story, but I'm a solutions-minded person. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think a solution is? Like you've experienced that probably more rawly than a lot of people have. And uh, back in a different time, now you've seen social media, you see it, you deal with community and students and things still. What's a solution? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I think, I think there's certain things that, you know, parents can do um, and, you know, schools can do to prevent it. But a lot is, of, yes. Is preventing it really the answer, though? Because it's, yeah. Uh, let's say awareness. They can raise awareness. awareness. Good. But here's the it, bottom line, I think, Matt. Why do people make fun of other people? It's their own, it's their own yes. self esteem and value. Perfect. And so, if that's where you're heading on yes, that one, I would exactly. agree with you that for me, um, 
that's why I got so obsessed with sports. It's like I wanted to find value in something yeah. that would that would keep me going. It wasn't until years later that I learned that the value was in me, how God yeah. made me and shaped me. Yeah. And I know that that's your message to high school students and and younger kids. And I think that is the right message. You've got to be comfortable with who you are. You got to equip. Uh, we we as responsible humans have to equip other people on how to work through some of those things and issues. And in order to give them the equipment, you have to be you have to be right on the inside. I mean that mm -hmm. is that's the only way. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you seen my distracted driving, specific distracted driving? Were you at the Byron the one in High Byron, School? Yeah, I was at the one in Byron. It, at the high school? At the high school. Was that 20... Was this just a year ago. 2019? Just a year ago. Yeah, yeah I was so there. you were at the high school. Yep, yep. Um, so what I do is I share a story and I share the why and then I give them the choice, right? And I think that's what, even with bullying, I think we have to show people the why and then we have to give them the choice we have to educate we i think attacking the bullies isn't the answer i think equipping the the bullies and i think equipping the victims mm -hmm. is the answer give mm -hmm. them that equipment on the inside right mm -hmm. and instead of trying to come at it as all we're doing then ourselves are attacking and things like that and trying to prevent something from happening from the outside and prevention isn't that's never going to happen yeah yeah, good point. And, and, and I mean, that's my opinion. Yeah, no, I, w I would agree with that. Because, you know, the thing about it is, is we're still all humans. Yeah. Um, you know, and inherently we're, we're made in the image of God, but there's also the issue of, of sin in the sense that left to my own devices, you know, I'll become selfish. Right. Um, you know, and I've, I've done a lot of study over the years on philosophers and humanists, and what they always end up at at the end of their life is what they, they thought they could believe that human beings had the answer. Yeah. But ultimately, they got to the end of life wanting because they realized that the heart of man can be evil when left to its own devices. There needs to be some moral compass for us to combat that, I think, and, and so that's why I think it's hard, you're right, to completely prevent it because you're dealing with imperfect human beings. Right, and certainly I don't mean by encourage it. Right. But what I mean is is not by prevention. It's like, it, it's like if I were to go into a school or into any of the different things that I do and, and go into it thinking that I'm going to prevent anything is very short-sighted, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to prevent it yep. by having the mission to prevent it. Yep. Now, I'm probably going to make the biggest difference, in my opinion, if I educate, give the why, and then give the choice. Yep. Empowerment, yep. right? In Empowering the victim to not be a victim. Empowering the bully to not be a bully. I mean, instead of locking them up or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm obviously extreme there, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, that's I, I, that prevention, boy, that's just, it doesn't seem like a very good tool to me in, in almost anything. Yeah. And, and I've read some things recently that that was with the Just Say No campaign related to drugs. And even the D.A.R.E. program has had limited success yeah. because to just tell kids not to do it. Exactly. But you've got to get to the core of why they use, which is probably a big part of my story. So I moved to Minnesota. I'm the new kid, and I'm an eighth grader. Yep. Middle school, high, a junior high, it's a rough time. And it's a rough time because you have a bunch of adolescents who are trying to figure out who they are. Yeah. And you remember the movie Breakfast Club? I yeah. mean, the one guy who's the hood, well, he's beat up at home. Yeah. And so the reason why he picks on other kids is he's 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 beat up at home and he's yeah. watching his mom be abused. And and so what's the family dynamic? You know, I see that in football too. You know, you see different kids who seem to respond well to direction. And even if you get on them a little bit and other kids don't, and the big determining factor between the two is one has a pretty healthy home life not perfect but pretty healthy and the other one has dysfunction at home and uh and so coach halder will often say you know uh it's maybe equal treatment but not fair treatment because mm. you know because how i handle one kid might be different than another simply because their personality is different their experiences are different 
Um, so we want to make it equal, but it's not it's not necessarily that's, yeah yeah that's really good because um, I've looked a lot at equality versus equity treatment too yeah. right and and there's that's such a big difference too mm-hmm. um, I mean what you know equity treatment versus equality I mean what what are you asking for uh, and I don't mean you personally but right. I mean like the football players and d- different things they think that they're asking for equal treatment, but in a lot of cases they, they, they're looking for the equity treatment. Yeah. Right. Like they want to have, my parents are so-and-so or, you you know, the, the, the equity. I think that's so important. Yeah. Yeah. And did did I say that to make sense to you in a short story? I mean, not even a short story, but. Right. And I just want to make sure that I'm using fair and equal in the, in the right ways. But I think, well, for example, my experience of being a youth pastor, and I had a couple of girls come to me who are from pretty healthy, balanced homes. You know, both mom and dad were at home, still married, no divorce, no, you know, again, not perfect, but a much different family dynamic. And girls were both good students. Um, and then one time they said to me, well, it seems like you invest more time and spend more time with the troubled kids. Mm. And my explanation to them was, you know, I value you the same as those kids, but the amount of time that I have to invest in, invest in them is different because their needs are greater than your needs. Yeah. And so, so what it takes for it's John fifteen. Yeah. 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 The ninety nine and the one. Exactly. Yeah. And and just to say to them that there's that there's a difference, um, and yeah, obviously in Jesus' ministry there are people that needed a lot more help. Yeah. You know, men with leprosy, a man who's blind, yeah. uh, needs a different kind of help than the lawyer who says to him, well, how shall I in- inherit eternal life? You know, <laughs> completely different. Yes. So I, I think they begin to see that, but that's always the hard part in that's dealing a, That's a very, thanks for uh, giving that in that story form. That actually helped me quite a bit just now. Yeah. And yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So in my mind, all of those kids were, were equal but it wasn't necessarily equal time or equal effort because, you know, um, there were just a, a couple of young men that I invested in a lot that my son used to call the Lugnut brothers. It was kind of funny. <laughs> but but they would they would stay at my house. They and they came from more difficult home dynamics, whatever it might be. But um, but it's also an investment. Yeah. And I feel like with them, the time I invested in them, because they were open to it. And also, too, you know, you there's a difference between when you're a man working with, with boys versus a woman working with girls. And so yeah. often in my youth ministry, try to use my have my wife or other women work more with the girls because yeah. that gets to be a tricky dynamic as well. For sure. But anyway, so, yeah, I, I see that a lot. So, you know, getting back to the idea of, of bullying and why it happens and all those things, I think that that's what part of it is because I noticed for myself – there's a couple of things that happened in response to that. One was was my intense focus on athletics and doing well in sports. But there was also an element that I believe that most kids don't use drugs and alcohol because they want to get drunk or because they want to get high. It's because they want to fit in. We mm. talk a lot about peer pressure. But you can imagine me now. I move into a new community. I'm not accepted. I've made fun of. But if I just hang out at a party... Uh, I can be accepted immediately by certain students in that school. Sure. And so I think that's kind of what happened to me in my high school experience, not being tempted to use until like eighth or ninth grade, all of a sudden experimenting because, well, now they accept me. Mm. Um, And so I think that that's another reason why you help kids understand what their value is. Yeah. Because, you know, they're looking for acceptance and they'll do whatever because the pain of being rejected may be greater than the pain of drinking and driving or or getting high or getting kicked out of my sport activity because I got caught using drugs or alcohol. And it seems like that, yeah, to be accepted is a higher value than the than the risks I take. Yeah, because that value is so internalized and these other things are external that you're bringing in, right? Like mm-hmm. you're bringing in the drugs, you're bringing in. So we don't, under, certainly at that age, we don't understand bringing those things in, like you say, the risk versus the value. Yeah. I mean, that value is so internal. 
and trying to bring in these other things to to increase that internal value yeah it's not possible yeah and well and then you kids deflect i learned to deflect and yeah. what i mean by that is is if kids were making fun of me um, I could make fun of another student who was overweight and I could make some derogatory comment about him and then all of a sudden it would turn. And, I, and as I got older, I felt horrible about that. But it's almost like self-preservation. Sure. Uh, another reason why humanism fails because ultimately humanism says it's survival of the fittest. Yeah. You know, and, and in the debate we're, we're having right now is everybody saying, no, it shouldn't be survival of the fittest. It shouldn't be the strong always that are the ones that get justice. So... I think that's a, a really important thing, too, for kids to understand. And then I think the other thing is just learning to be resilient. Yeah. You know, are you going to give up and crawl in a hole? Are you just going to every day, again, courage over comfort? Are you just going to try your best to get through each day and press forward and maybe use that um, negative experiences that you're having to fuel the fire to work harder? Um, and I think maybe in my own life um i think about what i was able to do in athletics and i wonder was i so strongly motivated by the desire to fit in and to feel valued that i worked that much harder mm -hmm. for example i remember a former minnesota viking uh jeff seaman who uh jeff is was in, involved in a ministry called Search Ministries, and I met Jeff years ago, did an outreach at one of the churches I served. Great guy. Um, unfortunately, starting to deal with some of the CMT issues mm. of losing his memory. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we see more of that in former NFL players, although I don't have any of that. And uh, when I recently had a neurologist check me out because the NFL with a concussion settlement has been doing that with different players, he said, you're fine, you're good. And 90% of the guys I see are good, but the 10% mm. have some real issues. And of course, he played in an earlier day when players were using their heads more, the equipment wasn't as good. Yeah. But uh, he told me one time, he came from a divorced home. He said 80% of the athletes in the NFL came from broken homes. No kidding. Yeah, and I don't know how that's changed, but a very huge percentage and so what are they doing? They're working so hard in many cases because they want acceptance and be valued by that dad who left them. Or, you know, because often kids, as, as you've experienced, I'm sure, Matt, when their parents get divorced, they think it's their fault. I must have done For something sure. wrong. Yeah. And they're working so hard to get the approval of that parent. And they're driven. They're motivated. They're driven. Um, to win. <clears throat> I mean, you've got to be really competitive. And I, my family tells me I am, tells me I am too competitive. <laughs> and, uh, and I grew up with two sisters and a brother who all played sports. So we were all competitive. But, you know, that's, that's the driving force. Can you really see me? Do you really love me? Do you really accept me? And I have to be honest that I loved sports. But I think part of it was that wanting to feel acceptance, wanting to feel value. So often when I talk to students over the years, um, sharing at, at different events of my own story of faith, and I will say that when I came to faith in Christ, I began to understand that my value was inherently in God and how he viewed me. Because when sure. I was in those younger years, I saw value in being accepted. So I'll do whatever I need to do to be accepted. Or I saw value in excelling in sports which fortunately I was able to do, but it took some hard work because it didn't at first come naturally to me. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the motivations I think that, that shaped my life. Um, and I'd like to say it was courage and some of it maybe was, but I think some of it was the resilient resiliency came from a place of, I want to be feel, I want to be valued. Sure. By others. And, and those things, um, Maybe a way to word it is it built muscle instead of callus, mm -hmm. right? It built that resilience muscle, so to speak, instead mm -hmm. of a, a callus mm -hmm. over it uh, that you just, you know, the, the callus is something that you just, uh, you don't want to attend to. It's just, it's more a negative thing, but building that yeah. muscle is kind of more of a positive. Yeah. And that's how it yep. sounds like you used it. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. And now a quick break. And uh, it's not a Kit Kat, sorry. Hey 
And now back to the episode. Yeah. Um, who are some like of your favorite players that you played with? I, I've been I've wanted to ask you that question for a while. Yeah. Not today, but Yeah. Yeah. Um And maybe I, you don't want to say I Well <laughs> Well, let me let me let me talk about a, a few guys. Um the first one that I'll that I'll talk about I always I I never got to play with Reggie White, but I always mm. respected him as someone who was a, a great football player, but also faith. You know, he's called the Minister of the, Defense. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and I always had this dream that I could be like Reggie White. Okay. Unfortunately, yeah. that wasn't God's plan for me. Yeah. Um, but someone that I really respected his ability and, and was pretty amazing was Bruce Smith uh, as a defensive lineman. Um, he was uh, he had unbelievable ability and when i listen to bruce speak now i didn't know it as as much then but as a man of faith as well and seemed to really handle the questions you know they lost four super bowls you know buffalo bills fans can <laughs> relate know, to vikings right? fans four super bowls <laughs> but you know he talked about you know what he learned in those losses and how he wouldn't trade those experiences so listening to bruce over the years i you know respected him as a player, um, there have just been different guys over the years that you know were believers. Um, Jim Kelly was a guy I played with for a while. You know, a lot of people have watched the battle that he's gone through uh, with cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as far as you know, ability, some of the the great players I played with were, were like Tony Dorsett. Uh, Herschel Walker was a guy I was impressed mm. with. I know Vikings fans. It's like, yeah. well, you know that Herschel Walker trade, right, right? But as a person, he was he was not only but but Dallas they they knew how to use him. The Vikings didn't use his ability maybe yeah. as effectively as Dallas. He he played very well. Was willing to play fullback, you know, even though he was Good. a running back at yeah. times, and he was used in different ways. But my locker was close to Herschel, so I really respected. Um, him as a person because he just was down to earth, mm -hmm. um, had a had a really humble attitude from my perspective being around him because what it looks like in a locker room is sometimes different than what it looks like uh, I on bet. the field. Yeah, I bet. Um, and, uh, yeah, there just were a number of guys on that Bills team that were guys that I really respected. John Kidd, who was a punter. Mm. Um, Frank Reich who was a backup quarterback now as a head coach. Uh, in the NFL, um, just different guys like that. Steve Tasker, who is now a reporter. Um, they were neat guys because these are guys that I would be in Bible study or chapel service with. So they would be tremendous athletes, but also faith was important to them uh, as well. And you know, as far as coaches go, um, I had a lot of respect for Marv Levy as a coach. Mm. Thought he was a solid, solid guy. Um, and then, of course, Tom Landry, who um was just a solid individual as well as as a person you know there's a lot of people that maybe didn't know tom that well but i remember i had some interesting interactions with him after my career was over uh, and he remembered who i was and oh, wow. we got into a good conversation one of them was a one of the incidents was a fellowship of christian athletes banquet mm. in the twin cities and Is that right? i saw him ran into him he remembered me we had a we had a good conversation and so it was interesting because as a player, it's like, well, this is the guy that cut me. Um, <laughs> but when the playing days were over, I mean, I just saw him as a guy who really, in the end, I understood had had concern for his players, um, and just was consistent in the way in the way he lived. Sure, he used to get a hard time in Dallas for being a man of faith. The the journalists in Dallas and people have heard this joke before. Back when Texas Stadium uh, it was a strange stadium because it had this hole in the top. So it was kind of shaped on the side and it had a hole about the size of the field. And so uh, the joke would be there, uh, why is there a hole in Texas Stadium so God can watch his team? That was the joke <laughs> that people used to tell about sure. Tom Landry. But um, anyway, uh, th those are just some people that, that I remember. And there are a lot of uh, good guys uh, in the NFL yeah. that, I, that I met. I mean, it's, the NFL is a microcosm of, of society. There, there are guys that are great guys. There are guys that are jerks. Um, yeah. There are just different issues. You deal all the issues that society deals with. You deal in the NFL, although they might be 
amplify it a little more because, you know, you're talking about men that are 21, 22 years old, all of a sudden making millions and millions mm -hmm. of dollars, maybe some of which because of their athletic performance weren't maybe challenged or held accountable as much. So they get into this environment where they haven't been held accountable because of their athletic ability. Yeah. And now you give them a bunch of money. And uh, that's a tough situation to put a young man in. Uh, not sure if they're ready to handle that. I, again, I'm thankful that I had um, a solid upbringing at home. I had a mom who was very financially frugal. So <laughs> when I got into the NFL, the money that I made, I learned how to save. Yeah. Uh, it got me through seminary. Um, just different things like that, that I, that I learned that I was able to be, conduct myself in such a way that I had to be careful. This career isn't going to last forever. Um, and to be more measured in my response to things and certainly be able to deal with disappointment at a young age because I got cut from four different teams. So, you know, again, the, the tenacity of continuing to go back, um, but of course with the injury. Um, I had opportunities to go back again and play, but because of my back injury, I just finally told my agent, I don't think I can do it. And at 40 years of age, I want to be able to, to yeah. play with my kids and hang out with my kids. Yeah. And so that's when I made the radical transition of going from an NFL player to a seminary student and eventually got my degree. Was that something that you thought maybe after retirement from the NFL you'd get into or, or anything like that? What were your, your dreams, your goals there? You know, it's really interesting because if you would have asked me in high school, I would have said no. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there's a funny story. Um, a church that I served in Chaska, Minnesota, went on a mission trip to Romania. While in Romania... Uh, they met a girl that I went to high school with. She was in my high school. Wow. Came from a, a Christian family. And they began to say, hey, our youth pastor is Kurt Pluger. And I guess her <laughs> mouth dropped, was like this, like, what? He's your youth pastor? I remember what he was like in high school. Wow. So, um, so the transformation, the change that, that God can, can bring about, because she remembers me from those days. But so when I went to college, it was to get a business degree. I thought maybe I'd go into something like sales. In fact, I do have mm. a business degree in case ministry would end or not work out. Sure. But I, uh, yeah, that's, that was my undergrad. And it was probably more just in the people that I had interactions with when I played football. I will often tell people the story. So my story of, of you know, where faith really became real to me was I was in college at uh, Gustavus Adolphus College. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, it's the end of my junior year. I was a first team All American that year. And of course, first team All American, small school. Um, but because of my size and athletic ability, there was these rumors about NFL and back then the USFL as sure, well. Yeah. And during that time, I had a, a hernia. So I had that mm. injury. And then later that spring, I pulled a hamstring and I began to realize that I'm not invincible. Long about that time, Wally Hilgenberg, a former Minnesota Viking, unfortunately another guy who was impacted by CTE, uh, and you know eventually Lou Gehrig's disease took you know took his life. Um, but he came and spoke to our football team. We had no idea. We thought he was going to tell NFL stories, which he did. But he really talked about how faith made a difference in mm -hmm. his life, how it changed for him from being really you know, a mean, nasty football player to someone who viewed life differently. One of his most poignant stories that I tell often is that at the old Metropolitan Stadium when the Vikings used to play outside, which was a huge advantage for him back then. <laughs> totally. Uh, and some of us remember <laughs> those days. And he said he was in the stadium. And, uh, and throughout this time, his wife was sharing a lot of things with him because she was a woman of faith. And he said, I looked out over at the stadium and it was empty, and there were papers blowing all around, trash, and the sun was setting, and it was cold, and he said, he thought to himself, that's my life without football. Oh, and, and that's, that's powerful. And that's what led him eventually to Christ, because he's like, I had all this money, um, I would spend money on nice clothes, I would buy a nice Lincoln Continental, and if it got one door ding on it, I'd get upset. I mean, he talked about and that's often what you see, Matt, in the NFL, is guys are open to faith because they have all this fame, all this prestige, and they look around and go, is this it? 
Yeah. Is this all there is? Sure. Why am I still unfulfilled? Why am I still empty? And so I'm thankful that I came to that revelation 21 years of age. I thought that makes sense to me. You know, I, I grew up in the church and I understood the Bible and who Christ was, but I realized I was far more committed to football. You know, my life probably when I was in college was football, partying, and school in that order, possibly. <laughs> and uh, that brought about a change that took some courage, too, because I, I had to make some changes in my life in the way I view things, mm. the way I did things. Um, Friend group, no doubt. Yeah, and the good thing about it is I had a good group of friends that even though the partying became less of a thing for me over time, they didn't reject me, you mm -hmm. know, um, yeah. that much because that can be a hard thing when you make some of those hard choices. Like, you know, I'm not going to do some of the same things I used to, mm -hmm. um, but I was young in faith and I was I was learning and growing. But that was kind of a pivotal moment for me, so that that was a change. But I still thought, okay, I'm going to possibly play football. Didn't know, because I was a junior, I still had a year left. I didn't know what was gonna happen. So graduate, um, get drafted by the Cowboys. Um, but it was while I was in the NFL, just the experiences that I had there, and even some friends that began to bring up that conversation. Well, what about ministry? One of my friends even said, hey, we should go to seminary. Well, I did, and he didn't, but he, <laughs> he is in ministry. He's done a lot of sports ministry over the years. Uh, he's in the Seattle area. He's been there for a long time. Um, another friend of mine, uh, Dave Gibson, who at one time was vice president of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, mm -hmm. now works at a church in the Twin Cities and has been real involved. He also went to Gustavus, played football. He actually was the one who brought Wally to our— Oh, wow. To our yeah to, to college to for for these football players to gather in a room and listen to what he had to say, and uh, I was in Kansas City because that's where FCA's headquarters are located. I was playing for Buffalo preseason game in Kansas City, often on the road in the NFL. The visiting team does their chapel services Saturday night. Mm. At home, we do them Sunday morning sure. before games. So I was at a chapel service. And he was the speaker, and I'd, I'd known Dave because of all the weight I'd put on, and I looked, <laughs> I think I had glasses on at the time, he didn't have my contacts, and he didn't recognize me at first. Sure. And Dave said something that, that stuck with me. He's like, well, when you hang up the cleats, maybe you want to come and join us uh, mm. at Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So that along with my friend, Chris, you know, sort of, because Chris really helped me grow in my faith, and that, that was the beauty of being in the NFL is is God had used an old football player to bring awareness of what it means to follow Christ, and then meeting coaches and other players who helped me grow in that. Yeah. Yeah. You are going to say something? No, I'm just, yeah, yeah. that's I, I'm, that's good. <laughs> I was thinking no. a question was there. I no, was trying no, to anticipate. No, I'm just soaking it in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you're a preacher, you try to read the crowd. Yes. So, you know, sorry. Or, or no, speaking. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now, a quick break from the podcast. Make a pizza. Joe on the couch. Get a massage. We'll be back in uh, about 10 seconds. And now, back to the episode. So, um, anyway, um, so those were sort of the experiences that made me begin to think about ministry. And I also began to see, Matt, that doors open for you to share about things simply because you played a game with a pigskin ball. Yeah. And uh, I know that when I used to do youth ministry and kids would hear that I was a youth pastor, that wasn't overly impressive. But the minute I said I played in the NFL or someone told them, because often it was someone would tell them because it wasn't like uh, something I carry on my sleeve. Um, if people want to talk about it, that's great. But, you know, that's one area of my life. But there's so many other elements. And but then it would just open doors then to begin discussions, especially with young teenage boys. And I thought, this is an influence. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things I've thought about for years is one time, I remember years ago, Charles Barkley, and, and I like Charles Barkley. He's entertaining. <laughs> he is entertaining. <laughs> and, and he one time said, you know, I'm not a role model. And yeah, I understand yeah. that, that he didn't want to be thrown into that position yeah. because that's not why he got into the NBA. However, when you're in the spotlight, spotlight like that, we don't really get to choose whether a role model or not because how are you a role model? Because young 
men especially and young women look up to you. Yeah. And so whether you choose to be or not, you're just kind of thrust into that. And that's one of the things I noticed that just having that opportunity to have an open door to speak into people's lives, I thought, well, God, I'm going to use this then. Yeah. I'm going to use this in positive ways, um, just like you're using your experience, a horrible experience yeah. of, of losing Deej to communicate to others. I could take my experience in a more positive way. And even my negative experiences when I was in junior high or the negative experiences of having an injury, to use those as opportunities to speak into the lives of others. Um, and I think it's helpful, too, that like what your experience has been, the positive experiences can speak into other people's lives, but the negative ones can really speak into their life because if I'm speaking to someone who's gone through difficulties and I haven't, the response is, well, you can't relate to right. my issues. Right. You know, how can you really understand? Yeah. Unfortunately, I can relate to a lot of negative things. Mm hmm but it is opportunities, like you said. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're definitely opportunities, and we should use all of them. I, you, you say you don't really like wear the NFL on your sleeve and things like that. I, I understand where you're coming from, but I think you should because mm -hmm. I think it opens up so many doors, like you had said. Yeah. Um, I think it's just so important. We're given, in my opinion, by the Creator given these opportunities. Some of them are good positive opportunities like the NFL was for you, and some of them are negative opportunities like being bullied and going through that process. And so mm -hmm. that combination of opportunities is where, where the power is. Mm -hmm. Because we all go through them. We mm -hmm. all go through negative, we go through positive, and it's all how mm -hmm. we use them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, that's a, that's a, great, that's a great message. Um, because that's the reality of life, right? It is, mm -hmm. which is exactly why I'm doing Matt Logan Speaks as kind of like a channel, so to speak. I mean, it's just to share stories like yours of the negatives and the positives and um, just how it, build, it can build the muscle instead of a callus and things like that. And we shouldn't be callous to these things, but we should definitely allow them to build that muscle, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. um, in order to... Uh, really help other people um, build their muscle, we have to share our muscle, <laughs> right? Yeah. How, how we built our muscle. Yeah, you yeah, know? exactly. Um, exactly. And, and think of, you, you know, I, I posted this a few years ago, I believe it was, but uh, what does a, a Arnold Schwarzenegger, he didn't do it on his own. He had spotters, right? I mean, he had people there to help, help push him and to catch him so that he wasn't crushed by the weight, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's what we need to do. That's what we're, you and I, that's what I feel you and I are doing right at the moment is, you know, we're lifting weights and we're spotting for each other, right? Yep. And it's so important. I, I think so many people, A, they think that they're doing it by themselves because they're not looking around. And B is, is they're not asking for that spotter to come and help them. Like, hey, I want to work out this muscle, but I can't do this on my own. Mm -hmm. You know, will you, will, will you spot me? You know, yeah. help me from falling. Yeah. Right? It's so important yeah. that we do use all those opportunities as tools. Yeah, and I, and I think why that's why the current situation of the pandemic yeah. and social distancing and being in shelter, although things are opening up now, is so hard because I feel like, yeah, talked about the creator. Well, we were created for relationship. God, yeah, totally. God made us that way. And, and your weight room illustration is great because any athlete can tell you that their performance in the weight room, which is an important part of being an athlete, I would say for sure, is greatly impacted by my good friends who are there to spot me. Yeah. And typically there would be two or three of us because when you squat, you probably need two spotters. Right, right. Depending on how much weight Perfect. you're using. Yeah. Um, and, and I think about, I, I do think that there were times too where I may not feel like going into the weight room, but I tell you what, my roommate's going to get me there and vice versa. <laughs> And, uh, and I have to really thank, you're right, I've had great coaches along the way. Um, my roommate and other friends, you know, I came to college very, I mean, this is, this is the interesting part of my story. So you can imagine, I was a 6'5", 195-pound defensive end, and I played offensive tackle. Some people are like, 
I can't even believe you played that position at that size. But yeah, totally. You have to remember too. This is the this is the early '80s. Um, but so when I went to college, I had gained all of 10 pounds. So I come into college, 205 pounds to play defensive end. They moved me down to defensive tackle at 205 pounds and never really lifting weights a lot, a little bit. Um, but I had a roommate who had a great lifting program in high school. And so he's the one that got me started on lifting weights and he would get me in there and it was embarrassing. You know, guys <laughs> that were smaller than me could lift more weight than I could. So I had to get over that embarrassment. Sure. And and so we helped each other over the years. And you know, my friend uh, Scott, he dealt with some shoulder and neck injuries, and so I felt bad. His career was limited because of those injuries, but it made a huge impact on my life. In fact, when I uh, was inducted into the Hall of Fame at Gustavus Adolphus, I had my friend Scott do the address for me to introduce oh, me. Wow. Because of the impact, he was the best man in my wedding. We were roommates three out of four years at college. I mean, his influence in my life was significant uh, as a friend who was there for me at all times, even though for him, his career wasn't nearly uh, as successful as mine, but I feel like he was a great influence on my life as an encouragement to keep me going. Um, and I think about your illustration of lifting as well, and everybody who knows lifting it's it's an interesting thing because you get stronger through stress. Like the whole process exactly. of lifting is m micro tears in the muscle, mm -hmm. and that's why you do different lifts and rests. So then, as those tears repair, that's how you get stronger. Yeah. So your idea of muscles, I think, is a great illustration because muscles are developed through stress, yeah. through literal tearing, uh, to get stronger. And of course, if we don't do it. We atrophy. And that's one of the things I've noticed over the years uh, is that there are certain people that don't excel because they don't want to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not just about hard work. It's like it's about the gifts that God gives us. But it's also about the people that come alongside of us. But it's also about the fact that it takes some work. And I've, I've known many athletes over the years that weren't willing to do the work. Um, you know, that a lot of the work actually happens when no one's looking and right. no one's cheering. Right, um, right. And, uh, and so for me, I went from a 205-pound freshman to a 255-pound senior um, from doing the hard work. And it wasn't eating. by eating ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> I ate just about everything in sight back then <laughs> trying to, trying to yeah. gain weight because I, I, I was naturally thin. But I think that's something else too. My coach in college was a man of faith. And he saw something in me that, other people maybe didn't see because I knew I wasn't going to go to a Division One school. Even Division Two schools, the offers were limited. So I knew my experience was being at a small college because that's just where I was. But mm -hmm. I, I didn't let that get in the way of what could happen. I remember goal setting. It's an interesting thing, Matt. Uh, I love to tell this story. I had a coach in college, and uh, Coach Byrne had a real influence on my life. And we still have contact with each other, um, especially since I moved back to Minnesota from Arizona. And I remember when he came on campus, and I was a sophomore, it was my end of my sophomore year, and I came into his office, and he looked at me straight in the eye, and he said, are you a winner? And, uh, and I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> What's his deal, you right. know? Um, and I remember him, you know, encouraging me to set goals and to reach them. So I remember, I think in that same conversation, he gave me a piece of paper and it had several things on it, several goals. Captain, All-Conference, All-American, NFL. Hmm. I circled all of them. Now I didn't become a captain, so that one I didn't have control over for whatever, for whatever reason. My teammates didn't vote me in as a captain. Yeah. But all those other things I achieved and when I got drafted by the Cowboys, he stuck that in my mailbox to just, said this, just say, this is an example of setting goals and reaching mm. them. So I, he was one of the first people that I learned from in terms of setting goals. Um, and sometimes we may not reach those goals. Some people can have those same goals and it doesn't happen. But, it, but I think that was a process that I learned of saying, have something to shoot for. And try to get it to the best of your ability. 
because even in that goal that I had, some of it was still out of my hands. Yeah. The Dallas Cowboys could work me out, which they did, and could say, thanks, but no thanks. You know, it still comes down to them. And, yeah. and the power of, you know, and back when I played, there weren't guaranteed contracts for anybody. Yeah. So you could be cut at any time. Sure. And so really, those things were a bit out of your hands. There's certain things you can, con con you can control, but there's a lot of things that you can't. And so that's a lesson in life, too, of we like to think there's certain things we can control. But there's a lot of things we can. That's a whole hour long yeah, podcast yep, just yep. talking about that one exactly. word. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Control. Mm -hmm. Thinking we have it. Boy, yep. we could talk a long time about that. Right. Kurt, I think this is a good place to uh sure. to end. I think we should do this again sometime though. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a lot more to uh learn from you and I hope that you'd come back again. Yeah. So I'd now here's my cheesy acronym for you. Thank you for being shiny. Yes. Thank you for being strong. Thank you for being hope. Thank you for being influential. Thank you for being necessary. Thank you for being you. Yeah. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.